Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's ODI lunchtime lecture. I'm Elea, I'm senior consultant at the Open Data Institute. I have the pleasure to introduce you to Ruth Cutler. She is the co-director of Furtherfield, and she will speak today about how live action role play, in short, LARP, could fix real world social problems. Um, Furtherfield um, has started its life in 1996 at the backspace of the first cyber cafe in London. And they have since built an international network of artists co-creating um, across digital and physical space. Um, Ruth has told me yesterday that they have something very strange happening in, in the space in Finsbury Park, uninvited which if you check it out, is something very strange. You see it in the park, but also online. And it is the world's um, first global premiere of horror experiences from and for machines that have come alive. Before I hand over to Ruth, I just wanted to say a few housekeeping things. If you could make sure to turn off your cameras and put yourself on mute, that would be amazing. You can ask questions at the end of the talk and put anything into the chat while you're listening. And I will do my best to ask this question on your behalf. Um, the session will be recorded. Enjoy. Over to you, Ruth. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's a great privilege to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, really lovely to see so many fellow LARPers in the audience um, and I'm going to talk for about 20-25 uh, minutes and I'll show a little bit of film that we put together about the most recent LARP that we did and then it would be really great to have your questions and thoughts. I feel like this field, there's so much to say that um, I'm having to make agonising decisions all the time about what to leave out so you can determine some of what we talk about at the end through your questions. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. So yes, I'm the I'm an artist and artistic director of Furtherfield, uh, as as was just introduced, and back in. 2003, I uh, made a piece of net art that was called Rethinking War Games, and it was inspired by my attendance earlier, early in the year, or maybe 2002, I can't remember, of the million strong uh, march against the war in Iraq. And one of the one of my realizations in the series of protests that I was involved in was this sense that war is always in the interests of the rich against the inter interests of the poor. And I put out this image, so the chessboard hacked with all the pawns on one side and the higher pieces on the other. And then this is the day before social media has really kicked off, but I posted it to all kind of chess forums online. And I asked under what conditions could the pawns in this game win? And I got a lot of very angry responses from people who loved the game of chess and didn't like me messing with it, but also found myself in the middle of an amazing conversation with lots of very different kinds of people. And out of this came uh, online game hack which was essentially a game of pacifist chess for three players in which the third player played the pawns and the pawns played a blocking game and if they prevented pieces being taken uh, five goes in a row then the board started to be overgrown with grass and if that happened a number of times then the whole board would be covered with a wonderful ecology of grass and world peace would be declared because the war grid would no longer be there. And there were kind of two things going on here. There was one was this idea that I wanted to target the kind of alpha male chess brain and to 
kind of convert it to an enthusiasm for winning at peace rather than winning at war. And also an understanding that this is a game that basically models a system of hierarchical dominance and that is understood at that time like pretty much you could speak to any child in the UK at least over seven or eight and they all knew the rules of chess so it was a way to kind of um, hack, hack the playful imaginations of these people and kind of try and think a different way about how to get things done and this was an online game that was played in classrooms and we made a game of prepare, kind of prepare chess board that could be played at festivals but it, it's it's I, I think I'm talking about this because this, I think, was my first example of something where I suddenly realised the power of play to think about politics socially with a bunch of people online and to use the network to kind of crowdsource thinking about those things. Um, so the title of my talk is uh, How Live Action Roleplay Could Fix Real World Social Problems. I have a bit of an allergy to overclaiming. Um, so you're just going to have to decide whether I'm overclaiming on this and you can you can interrogate me at the end of the talk about this whether whether we really can fix real world problems with live action role play. Let's see. Uh, but live action role plays are a kind of they, they are turning into an emerging strand of work at further fields uh, decentralized arts lab and the decentralized arts lab has kind of grown out of uh, emerging work in like the last 15 years of work since the web got really centralized took me by surprise i have to say as a kind of utopian uh, open source peer-to-peer -peer person in the in the kind of mid 90s i really thought the web was going to allow us to see ourselves together and coordinate together and, and that the world would become a better place because of it but this kind of re-decentralization movement that we're seeing through um all, all kinds of technologies that I'll come to in a bit. And our lab is, this live action role play is becoming a regular strand of work that we're doing here. Uh, and it's, we're kind of aiming to explore how these technologies might support fairer, more dynamic and connected cultural ecologies and economies. So what, if, if we're making this claim for LARPs being able to fix things, uh, the, the one I'm going to focus on is the most recent um, LARP that we did, which is called Transcultural Data Pact. And I think the essential question behind here is why, like, why is it so hard to make good decisions about personal data? Um, so with social distancing and the kind of mass move to proprietary software like Zoom, uh, like Google Suite for both work and leisure, I think COVID-19 is exposing vulnerabilities of a kind of individualistic and competitive social system dependent on very poorly understood centralized digital media infrastructure. Um, so yes, our tools are designed for individual consumers in competitive markets rather than for he healthy societies. So uh, devices, platforms and services are pushing us towards personal gain and the interests of big business and away from collective distributed prosperity. And this, as we are seeing kind of emerge in front of our eyes, this accelerates the uneven distribution of access to fundamental utilities, life opportunities and political freedom. So we're seeing like access to fundamental needs like education, food, shelter, healthcare, money, uh, untrustworthy information systems and, and uh, news and lack of transparency in institutions and politics and surveillance and data extraction and targeting through the tools of connection like this that are really kind of fundamental to our operating in social fabric. Um, the last 15 years, as I was saying, I've seen this surge in decentralized technologies, but I think that this really shows a desire for change. However, as research at the New Design Congress is showing, uh, and I quote, from well-funded blockchain projects like IPFS to the emergence of large-scale information networks such as DAT, Scuttlebutt, and ActivityPub, 
um, that renewed life in peer-to-peer -peer technologies, a renaissance that enjoys widespread growth driven by the desire for platform commons and a community of self-determination. However, these developments are really fraught with dangers. Uh, they're putting well-meaning communities who want to do this kind of decentralized organize, organizing the distribution of power, but they are being often put at risk by a poor engagement with an understanding of the risks and dangers of the way uh, society and technologies operate in these in these kind of infrastructures so the relationship between our societies and technologies are really hard to understand um, this is because many technologies operate in the background so, so they are themselves invisible and hard to explain to everyday users i'll come on to the, who the everyday users are in a minute Technologies tend to be part of very complex webs of activity. And we focus in our thinking about this, we tend to focus on the choices of individuals, but we are social beings. And so all of this together makes it very hard for, for us to make informed choices in our, both in our own individual and collective interests, which we have to realize are kind of nested together. Um, and the users we're thinking about here are the us, all of us as users, uh, users through our daily interactions, our devices, and through the platforms we use. Also, the users who are excluded from interaction through devices, through no or low access to technical systems generally. Uh, as product and service providers, both public and private, and as policy makers and leaders. So what does LARPing bring to this situation? Well, let's just establish first what we know LARPing to be. So LARP stands for Live Action Role Play, and it's a form of game where participants, participants play characters who interact in a scenario to pursue goals that, that take place in a fictional setting. Um, Decal creates live art action research role play. So we've, we've kind of crammed a few other things in here. Uh, the, 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 the LARPing tradition kind of extends from at one end the, the kind of civil war reenactments or the war reenactments and Dungeon and Dragons. And at the other end, we have Nordic LARP which are much closer to a kind of artist they 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 sit with the artistic impulse and they stretch into this kind of participatory art form and in nordic larp players improvise an immersive performance to create new roles and inhabit them in a process that we're calling serious make believe so participants uh, take on carefully designed characters in a scenario that responds to research. They are often either gifted with or steered towards understanding what their motivations are and they're prompted to solve problems together. Um, and I know that like people have been asking me recently about the kind of connection between live action role play and scenario planning that's used in kind of businesses to help do future, future planning and avoid disasters. I think there's something very specific going on in the kind of LARPs that we're doing, which are we really, tr we, 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 we are prepared to go for the outlandish. So to put people into a very different imaginative state by going beyond what is known, familiar, beyond, in order to open up a, a kind of, to break down some of the social constraints that we might normally feel. Um, so in the last year, we've done these uh, three LARPs in collaboration with three different university departments. Uh, we're understanding now that LARPs can do this kind of deep, rigorous research uh, to facilitate powerful group-driven discovery and generate rich research data. So now London is a city farm. Um, was made in collaboration with researchers at City University and this was uh, around uh, it 
we thought together around how to build multi-species justice uh, towards prototyping blockchain systems. Uh, the fictional focus group um, we ran with UCL and this was we, we lived through the social consequences of radical transparency and transcultural data pact which is the lap I'm going to talk about um, we were thinking we were negotiating the future fortunes for society through personal data practices so this is how we think the LARPs are kind of starting to fix real world social problems. This is what they're doing. So they're bringing together cutting edge research and reforming them as these kind of bleeding edge scenarios. So things that happen in a world that is next to us, either temporally or spatially. Uh, players wear characters crafted uh, to bring their expertise to really wicked social problems. And then we set fire to the imaginations of experts in a game of serious make-believe. Now, experts may be leading academics in fields across social science, material science, uh, uh, engineering, um, law. Uh, they are also uh, people from the Zimbabwean food growers at the Spitalfield uh, community, community, uh, community farm. So it's people who are bringing the expertise either from their professional lives or from their daily lived experience. And it's this kind of bringing people together from across these kind of silos, backgrounds and disciplines where we see the kind of real uh, generative uh, potential of this process. Um, so, the Transcultural Data Pack. So, this used co designed data devices to explore how tools, interfaces, and data regimes affect how people value their data. Uh, I created this in collaboration with artist Kate Genevieve of Chrome Space. Uh, it was led, it was in a research project um, called Qualified Selves, led by Professor Chris Speed. Um, Dr. Kruka Pothong um, was my kind of research partner through all of this. And Billy Dixon and Evan Morgan were, had made these two devices from previous workshops. So the scenario is, a historic trade neg negotiation is taking place between two nations with a shared history but very different social values. Um, players signed up to play a two and a half hour game followed by a short research debriefing. Uh, they joined us for a preparatory meeting, an hour long preparatory meeting in advance. They received two personal devices, one called the Pebble, which was a way for them to consciously map their emotional uh, status in real time with each other. And the other was called the Blocks, which fed back uh, a whole load of personal and social data about their characters in the game. Uh, and they also received a Delegates Pack. So the Delegates Pack kind of set the fiction, set the fictional scenario up. So it told them, it gave them the details, it gave them the culture of the, the, the nations that they were from. And they could also, if they chose to read about the nations of the nation, uh, they could read about the nation that they were about to go into negotiation with. So they had this as kind of intel. And it told them the title of their role and top level kind of mission as well. The rest they had to make up. Now I'm showing, I'm gonna show you about a seven minute film. Bear in mind that this film is cut down probably from about uh, 10 hours of footage, which includes all the negotiations, all the workings out. This kind of gives you a insight into how people are operating with this. Now, I promise you, we hired no actors. I think there's something extraordinary going on in the performances of these people, uh, but you can decide what you think about that. Um, so, hang on a minute, I just need to check. Oops, oh dear, one sec. 
I do need to check that you can hear sound. I tell you what, I'm just going to play it. Oh dear. Ruth, why don't you play it and I'll give you a thumbs up if we can hear it. Can you hear it? Yes, I can hear it. Excellent. An historic trade negotiation is underway between two nations with shared ancestry and clashing beliefs. New Bluestead is an archipelago of more than a thousand floating cities rising from the international waters of Oceana, one of the last remaining dual societies. Liberty, our ocean. Our land is an island nation and a designated biosphere reserve. Its ecologically diverse society enjoys a temperate climate and verdant landscape of fields, downland and chines. All this beauty is between us. Over many generations, the cultures of our land and New Bluestead have come to be defined by two personal devices, the pebble and the blocks. The pebble supports the continuous development of emotional intelligence in the multi-species democracy of our land. The blocks fuels the optimized society and the automated government of New Bluestead under control of the intelligent dynast. They need each other's technologies. The transcultural data pact. Will they be able to negotiate terms? Can they find agreement through the discord? What will they decide? Um, I would like to ask about your uh, quality assurance processes um, in such a system where the access to data fluctuates according to whim and fancy. Um, how do you ensure that measures that you are taking are effective? How do you assure that the goals you are chasing are actually being achieved? We tune into each other. We understand what the other beings around us feel and we get insight into what they need. One observation I must make, which is glaringly obvious, is that our land has a food shortage and that is directly a, pr a productivity issue. The economy of reciprocity, that is a very foundation of our land. We do not believe in attractive processes of just taking from the planet, taking from our cohabitants, taking from our friends and community. We believe in giving back as much as we take. They do not agree. They don't have enough information. There is not enough time. But both civilizations face an evolutionary bottleneck and they need each other to survive. The emotional intelligence that they purport to hold um, slows things down a great deal and I feel that our efficiency will be compromised. I'm very concerned that they are not very in touch with their emotions and we have a steep hill to climb. I find it very difficult to understand why emotion is seemed to be something that we need to know more about. They are resistant because it is totally oppositional to their culture. It seems to be a totally erroneous assumption on their part that they will be receiving the vast spectrum of our technological advancement, um, which I, I must say I find laughable. Perhaps they don't understand how we are able to share so much knowledge. We can see here the ratings are for reputation, which is the R blue. Wellness, which will be very interesting to you, of course, in our land, and productivity. The ranking so shocked to me that the councillor assumed that that's what we would want at the base level. If they really don't know what they're doing, which is what it seems to, to come across as, then the chances are if we have access to that technology, we can take the data that we need. In our land, our data is part of our spirit. It, it is ours to do with us as we wish. They are robbing each other constantly of the ability to profit from one another's data. But we do need their data. We may be getting bogged down in them wanting our data, but I don't know that they necessarily do want our data. They seem to have no awareness of the severity of their own situation. I think the other important element of the data practice is even if we're not giving our own data, is that the Pebble system 
is not misused by the blue steaders in order to repress their populations. I feel there's potential to uh, hack their technology to actually be of great advantage to us. And what, what value do you think that, that might bring to us? Ability to control, of course. I, I just want to remind everyone that our society is out of balance. Mm. Our society is out of ecological balance. We have, do not have enough housing. This is not a technological problem, this is a societal problem. It seems to me that they have sat in a circle um, and kumbaya themselves into near starvation. It's very important that we request the blocks technology, but as Zaylin E said, with the ability to adapt it to our own needs. What technologies do we want from that to extend this to a three year process in the terms? Because it does feel rather rushed. It's interesting that they're offering a three-year process straight away, so they do think long-term sometimes. We do need to feed our citizens and house them and make sure that we all we can survive. We want to keep them alive. We want to be seen as a society that cares <laughs> enough to help provide the end of hunger. If we solve the energy generation, we can create food from that energy. I think we hold all the cards, don't we? We um, ask for the blocks algorithms fully open and with our ability to adapt them however we want without their interaction. And we request that the blocks algorithms are fully open and grant us the ability to interact with them in the way we need and desire or we will not exchange technologies. Well, this is interesting, isn't it? I must remind you we're running out of time. How much time do we have? You have about three minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> three minutes, three years, you know. Where... <laughs> it is a take it or leave it situation. Oh dear. They've asked for the secret technologies, the energy generation and the blocks in return for just one technology, their pebble. It doesn't feel like a very balanced exchange. A quick vote. Are we going to accept that or are we going to say no? Okay. Transcultural Data Pact is a live action role play or LARP, a game of serious make believe, in which role play is used to explore how personal and collective data practices and devices might shape the attitudes and fortunes of a society. So I'll just wrap up with a few reflections. So what are our findings? Well, we have three papers currently undergoing academic peer review and each LARP provides its very own particular insights into the research areas that we were kind of delving into. But I think there's three common learnings from uh, the pieces that we've done so far. One is that this kind of deep immersion in improvised research-based scenarios connects people, experts across silos uh, and backgrounds to kind of get to the heart of the significance of emerging research. Um, players learn what's at stake in complex network societies. Um, they get a feeling for the the things that are invisible that are hard to grasp because they are together and it really shows the importance of agency and negotiability in current and future social technological systems. Um, I'm going to finish with two quotes from two players, one of whom at least is in the room. So this is then playing Figs the Bard for the Hourlanders. Uh, from the Department of Zoology at Gershon College. And he said, I could get a bunch of people to sit together in a committee and list the sort of problems you could expect when you are suddenly confronted with a completely incompatible civilization and needed to communicate with them. And we would never have come up with the notes that I made in the game. 
Um, and artist Kate Genevieve, who collaborated with me on Transcultural Data Pact, was a participant in our earlier LARP, the Fictional Focus Group. And she said, by improvisation and creative relational engagements, we actually learned something in those relational connections that is much more than I would have learned by using my own head and experience to come at these issues today. Um, so I'm going to wrap up there. Uh, I want to thank all of the amazing collaborators and in particular, Dr. Krokai, Pothong, who co-designed and facilitated the in-game deliberation, reflections and surveys that kind of really enabled us to learn about what our LARPs are doing. And I look forward to the conversation now, and, but please also do get in touch if you would like to be involved in the upcoming LARPs that we're developing that are specifically focusing on um, better communication and collective health of living systems. Uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Ruth. That was a really, really interesting talk. Um, we are now open for questions. Um, you can just ask your questions in the chat box. But um, to kick us all up, um, I think I'm going to start with the first question. And this is like, how long do these labs usually take? Is this hours, days, weeks? Do you mean how long do they take to create or how long do they take to participate in? To participate in. <laughs> so um, that it varies. Uh, the ones that we've done that some people like I participated in a LARP last weekend that had me in game for nine, nine hours in three, three hour sections over two days. Um, I haven't made a long LARP yet. Uh, these, the ones we've done have all been somewhere, we've been in game for about two to two and a half hours, usually with some kind of workshop, workshop preparation, warm up. Uh, and then usually we would expect participants to need to spend at least an hour to get their head into their characters and, and to understand what the kind of scenarios are. Um, yeah, so for this one, there were two, I think that the kind of challenge for participants in this was to really understand what these two kind of uh, data culture regimes, what the difference were. So we had the kind of peer to peer very um, like very strict uh, data sovereignty rules for the Owlanders. So like data theft was really kind of regarded as a big no, no. Whereas on for the new Bluesteaders, the, the idea of not just having all of your data available for use by the, by the art, artificially intelligent governance system and this kind of gamified governance system was regarded with equal abhorrence so you, it's like having people people needed to, to do a little work to kind of understand what's at play in these two very different uh, cultures thank you very much so we have questions coming up one from perry walker did um our land and blue says reach any agreement if so what was it um well in the we, we ran Transcultural Data Pack twice. The first, the outcome of the first game was that we became, the two nations became immediately very polarized and quite contemptuous to, towards each other and seemed to waste no opportunity to use all the negotiation time to lecture each other on how rubbish each other were. Um, and no agreement was reached and they made very strict demands that it was really obvious neither would take and then the second day we had a lot more it was very interesting we had a kind of completely different dynamic in which people were trying to find ways to keep the to keep it open so I think we ended up with an agreement where we agreed that we would continue to talk for the next three years and that there would be a series of joint national game events. I think we ended up with a multi-species Olympics as the game event that would bring our nations together to really kind of come to a shared understanding. 
And then we have another question coming up from Kate um, from New Design Congress. And they ask, what are some of the challenges for LARPs that are held completely online versus offline IRL? And are there opportunities that you want to explore with online LARPs? Yeah, I mean, it's a very, very big question. Uh, I think if we kind of zoom out, the, the, the kind of online versus offline, it has a whole load of things that aren't to do with LARPing, but they're to do with people's access to technology. Um, the, the, like we're excluding a whole bunch of people when we run things in Zoom or in Discord or using these kind of technologies. So, so that's one aspect of it. Um, the fictional focus group that we ran was designed to be run in a room uh, that involved quite a lot of deliberation and the loss of peripheral vision and being able to communicate with body language and a kind of much the, the kind of breadth of communications that happen when you're in a room with a group of people meant that we had to do a complete adaptation. Uh, and I think we lost quite like it. It meant that people have people have to work harder, basically, to both express themselves and communicate with each other and to listen in this kind of setting. I think we're all kind of getting familiar with that as a problem. Um, and then we're just kind of exploring the kind of the the game that we're actually making with Kate, who asked that question. Next, one of the ones we're working on in next summer is a game called the Treaty of Finsbury Park, which is uh, the scenario is a future multi-species revolution that takes place, takes place in Finsbury Park and then goes viral across global green, green urban spaces. And here we're going to be looking at some very interesting and tricky problems about how you communicate with, how we communicate with more than human beings and living systems and then physicality is going to become really important. Thank you. So we have lots of new questions coming up. We have one from Karin Yeager who asks, what does a fictional setting mean or going into character? Is this the same like online or and the offline distinction? Um, Yeah, I mean, there's, I think there's two questions there. So the, the, for me, the power of going into character is that in some ways, if you're with a group of people who you know, or with a group of people who you don't know, but for whom you have a professional relationship, you're constrained to perform an identity that people expect or to consciously break against it. And that has a particular kind of dynamic to it. The thing about taking on a character is that it actually makes people more free to command their character and command the actions of their character and experiment with what happens when characters interact with each other. And that for me is one of the real rich beauties of this as a process. Uh, in terms of online and offline, when, you're, when we're on life, as Stacco Troncoso puts it, like if we're together in a physical space, uh, even if we even if we have devices with us, um, we don't have the difficulty of children coming in and demanding a can of baked beans, or of needing to go to the toilet and then getting caught in a conversation with other family, other members of your family. So that this kind of breaking down of the fiction can happen in the in the like in these online sessions. Um, so I think there is the potential for them to be immersive in a different kind of way if you're in a shared physical space. And just the kind of general richness of smells, you can use food, drink, uh, physical, like more physical coordination, all of those kinds of things allow you to make very much kind of richer, stronger connections. Um more questions. I'm going to have so, to keep my answers shorter, sorry. I'll try. I know we have 10 more minutes to go. Nope. Um, so we have Christina asking, did you collect any information on the previous gaming experiences of players? Are these games, oops, that just vanished. Um, are these games more accessible for experienced players than for people who don't regularly play? 
I think we've played, I think about 95% of the people who've played our games have never done a LARP before and aren't big games players. And a really common comment from people is that they thought it was going to be really embarrassing and awful and that, they, that it wasn't going to be for them and that pretty much the minute you're into it, they are deep into it with the, if you set a hard enough challenge, chick fiction challenge and game challenge, but people forget that they're doing something that would ordinarily be embarrassing. That's, that's, that's been the kind of overwhelming response from people. Then we have Perry asking, going back to your start as a chess player, my pawns aspire to become a queen. Did you explore queens becoming pawns? Uh... I think it probably did get discussed in it didn't that didn't end up as a function of our final game uh, but there was all kinds of discussions about this kind of conversion conversion of power in the game it's a nice question and then we have another one um, which is quite interesting from um, Henry how do you think club would work if the players had a person connection to the subject matter um, well, I guess what we're trying to do with our LARPs actually is to ensure that people do have a personal connection with the subject matter. I think they don't work if people don't have a personal connection with the subject matter. So the fictional focus group, I mean, we, 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 they're, in some ways they're really outlandish, but they're always dealing with things that everybody has, like, that they're always just like on the other side of reality. So they're always connecting with things that we feel are probably important to most people. Like uh, we spend like our relationship with these devices, we don't think about it a lot, but it's really fundamental to so much of the way we relate to each other and we organize our lives. So yeah, I think, I mean, we got that, there was some discussion around the transcultural data pack because the new blue steaders they're a dual society which is a kind of coded that there's there's a very unpleasant social order at play in new blue stead and we had conversations around keeping players uh feeling uh safe and able to take uh to deal with any difficult conversations or difficult feelings that kind of came up in the game and we had to kind of work quite hard to ensure that we were doing like providing care systems for people who were participating in this process um yeah we aim to get it we, we really aim to hook into people's daily experience otherwise they don't really work okay five minutes more um so we kind of have to wrap it a bit short. We have a question from Finn, who asks, uh, do you know of any examples of LARC being used in for, of a, as part of a policy consultation? And what would be the challenge of using LARP for that purpose? Um, I should, but I don't. Um, I mean, from my perspective, because I'm an artist, so the challenge for me, if I was designing for that context, and I am in conversation with a few people about this, and I think it's really fascinating, but I think the challenge would be to be allowed to keep it strange. Um, I think when people feel like they're doing serious work, they want it to look serious. And actually, I think you get to the serious work by making things unfamiliar and putting people into a very different imaginative space. So I think that that would be one of the challenges would be of engaging the people who you wanted, whose expertise you wanted in a process that looked and like once they walked through the door we're we're in the game and it will work. But getting people through that door may be a challenge. I don't know. I'm, it's a it's a great question. I think it has really a lot to offer as well. Then we have from Irina. Could you please tell us a bit about the process of creating designing LARPs? What are some of the key steps, main workflows? And she has also a second question. 
in the context of organizations that use mostly committee meetings and open-ended discussions to collaborate, how would you recommend LARP projects are introduced, communicated about? Are there any specific challenges which should be taken into account when designing LARP for these contexts? Um, yeah, I mean, so, so far the process, I think like I'm, there's a whole world of LARPers out there. Like there's really a lot of work going on in this field and I'm relatively, like I've been working with LARP for two or three years now and there's massive kind of divergence in the way people do this. The way I do it is I, it's usually through encounters with researchers whose work I find fascinating and uh, and also researchers whose work I feel would benefit from engagement with people from very diverse backgrounds and expertises and then finding uh, finding a context that is something usually like a world either that we would want to see uh, like to, to make something that is a future that people could imagine trying to work towards and then building a scenario or a very familiar like like the one we did with uh, the algorithmic food justice guys uh, Sarah Heitlinger at City University this was around food justice and we used the format of two general assemblies so we used like a very familiar format but participants played dual human and non-human players in the assembly. So you might have a human who is also a bee, who, and they were having to speak for the interests of both players at once. So using quite familiar social, social settings and making them strange in some way. It's a, it's a long, it's a long question and using them, using them in everyday social settings, I just like, Think people should experiment with them um, you could you could possibly it might be fun to think about what LARP you might design for a five minute interaction um, I'd, I'd like to think about that some more so I'm gonna ask one last question and then I think we should see of how people can redirect question to you because mm -hmm. I think there's so much more to speak about um, I'm going to ask the last um, question from Kate. She says, there is so much laughter in these LARPs. Do you think that making space for qualities of playful lightness in the exploration of wicked problems of our time changes creative research culture? Um, it, I mean, it makes me happy just to hear that question. Um, I think we really need it. I think it would be, I think it's definitely something to aim for. I think there's this kind of constriction around like looking at important things and getting to the answers fast that actually cuts so much potential out. So um, yeah, I hope the answer is yes. And it would be something to work, work towards, I think. So Ruth, how can people get in touch with you and how can people sign up? Um, LARPs. Let me let me put my last slide up again because uh, it has my email address in it. Um, that's me. Uh, you can see my email address at the bottom there. Uh, we're on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, although I'm not. Um, but further field is so you can contact us through any of those. And if you're doing LARPs, we want to know about them as well. And yeah, come and talk to us. Thank you very much. And apologies to all those I didn't have time to ask the questions um, of, on behalf of them. Um, I hope you're going to have a continued good um, conversation with Ruth and wish you a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.